I mean, we hear about the type of research uh, Scott is doing, but perhaps the best way to describe is that he's the master of turning any foundational question about physics to a complexity question. And with this way, bringing the great inside to physics, as you will see uh, he has done. So before we start, I would like to, um, oh, the most important thing to acknowledge the great achievement of Scott is that he's Alan uh, Waterman Award, which was uh, for 2012, uh, the most prestigious honorary award in US, uh, given to any scientist under 35, which makes you a millionaire, uh, apart from being prestigious. And uh, that was great. Uh, our field got that, uh, thanks to Scott. And um, so um, thanks to Quisco and Sixa that we could have uh, Scott. We heard about um, a wonderful series of lecture during the week, technical one. And now over to you, Scott. Thank you. OK, well, uh, thank you uh, so much, Alham. By the way, you know, I, I don't think research funding dollars can make you a millionaire. But uh, 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 is you know my first time in, uh, in Scotland, in my, my namesake country, I guess. And uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's wonderful to be here. I've always wanted to visit and uh, to be here uh, uh, among, you know, with, with, uh, with, with, with Alham and uh, Rahul and so many other uh, great friends at, uh, at the university here. So uh, OK, so I wanted to tell you about quantum computing and the limits of the efficiently computable. Uh, so uh, when I did a Google image search for quantum computer, this was uh, one of the first things that came up. Uh, that's apparently what they look like. Uh, so you know, I should I should warn you that I'm a, I'm a theorist. I'm not an engineer. Uh, so uh, you know, um, um, okay. <laughs> So uh, the starting point for this talk uh, is that uh, there are certain you know technologies that would be really great if we had them, and yet you know we, we just you know years and years have passed and we still don't see them. Okay, so uh, uh, the first example is a warp drive, right? Uh, uh, you know we were promised it as kids. Where where, where, where is it? Okay, second example is the perpetual motion machine, right? The, uh, you know, I think like the only, you know, true long-term solution uh, to the world's energy problems. Okay, uh, the third example is what I call the Uber computer. Okay, uh, now this is a machine, you know, you, you know it, it doesn't, you know, tell you the meaning of life, you know, or, or anything like that. But, uh, you know, any well, at least well-posed mathematical problem that you could give to it, it immediately tells you the answer. Okay, now some people may think that, that you know, the computers we have today are already like that. Okay, but, uh, you know, uh, you know so, somehow, you know, uh, um, um, human mathematicians have not yet been put out of a job entirely, right? Uh, uh, because you know there are certain problems where uh, you know we could uh, we could easily recognize an answer if it were given to us, and yet to find the answer, you know, may require search among an astronomical number of possibilities. Okay, so here, you know, I've uh, shown you know this 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 machine, you know, it, it says you know Goldbach conjecture true. Next question, right? Uh, just you know any uh, uh, famous unsolved problem of mathematics, right? Uh, uh, you know, it would just uh, immediately answer for us. Okay, and this is this is another thing that that in fact we don't see. There's still you know there seems to be some sort of creative leap that's required. You know, not only in, in mathematics but uh, in um, 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 in, in, in engineering and you know in in, in, uh, in, in so many other areas okay where uh, you know we uh, um so uh, okay, so now you know we can ask why are these things impossible, right? Uh, you know, is it just uh, that uh, you know engineers haven't been clever enough to build them, right? Well, you know, in the first two cases, we we sort of know the answer to that question, and we know that you know it's not you know just sort of a, a contingent fact about the history of technology. The fact that we don't have these first two things really reflects something uh, fundamental about the laws of physics. Okay, uh, warp drive, uh, uh, you know, is ruled out by uh, the special theory of relativity. Okay, or you could say just sort of by the causal structure of space and time. Uh, the uh, 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 perpetuum mobile is uh, ruled out, of course, by the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, so what about uh, the third one? Right, uh, you know, is the uh, impossibility of uh, you know, of, of Uber computers, or you know, rather just the fact that we don't see them now, right? Does that reflect something about the laws of physics? Okay, so you know, given uh, the way I've set up this talk, you can probably guess that you know I think that the answer is yes. So, uh, so that's that's what I want to tell you about. Uh, so, okay, so first, uh, though, you know, I should I should say, well. Um, 
you know, because this is the Alan Turing centennial year, and I know that that's a big deal here in the UK. Well, you know, it, it, is, it is for me too. And uh, so, um, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, weren't the limits of computation, you know, already worked out sort of by Alan Turing and his friends in the, in the 1930s? And, you know, and wasn't it really basically a question of mathematics and logic that didn't really have much of anything to do with physics? Uh, well, okay. Um, uh, the, uh, um, the, the issue is, you know, I think from, from the modern point of view, right, I like to think of the theory of computability that sort of Turing and, and Gödel and people like that pioneered as sort of a, a, a you know, a beautiful warm-up sort of to the big questions, you know, the ones that we, we sort of, we, we really care about. Okay, so they answered questions like, you know, given a mathematical statement, you know, is there an algorithm that would find, that would tell you whether there's a proof or, or disproof of it, you know, within some fixed system of axioms. Okay, and the answer is no, there's no such algorithm. Okay, and that, you know, follows from the, the unsolvability of the halting problem. Okay, but, uh, um, you know, today we ask things like, okay, so fine, what if you just want to know, you know, given the Goldbach conjecture or the Riemann hypothesis or whatever, whatever is your, your favorite question, you know, is there a proof of this or disproof with a billion symbols or fewer? Right, you know, then, uh, you know, that clearly is a, decidable problem. You could program your computer to solve it, okay, by enumerating all possible proofs of that length. Okay, the only problem is that, you know, the whole universe would have disintegrated into black holes and radiation, you know, long before your computer had made the tiniest dent, you know, in the, in, in the calculation. Okay, so, uh, uh, so, so, so we would like to know about, you know, the complexity aspects. And so that's really what I'm going to talk about uh, today. Okay, well, so some of you may say this sounds like a, a big question. In fact, a literally uh, million dollar question, uh, namely the uh, famous P versus NP problem. Okay, this is, uh, you know, a problem of great uh, practical importance, as you know, you can see, because uh, it's, it's done cameos on both The Simpsons and Futurama. Uh, it's a bit hard to see there, but uh, it's, it's there. They, uh, um, uh, so, you know, if you solve it, you get a uh, million dollars from the Clay Math Foundation. That's a million, that, you know, personal money that you get to keep. <laughs> and, uh, um, um, you know, now, now uh, some of you may know that, you know, there, there are seven of these problems, uh, including, you know, the, uh, the, the Riemann hypothesis, the Poincaré conjecture, which was solved by Grisha Perlman, although he turned down the prize. Uh, and, um, um, and, f and four others, okay? But, uh, you know, my, my own view is that P versus NP is sort of manifestly the most important of any of these problems, okay? And my argument for that is very simple, uh, that, uh, well, if P were equal to NP, you know, so that, that means that if there were a polynomial time algorithm, you know, on a, running on a conventional computer to uh, solve the NP-complete problems, or, uh, you know, that would, that would not merely you know, solve that, that one sort of problem of the Clay Foundation, but you could probably also use that uh, to solve the other six problems as well, okay? Uh, and the way you would do it is you would program your computer to find the proofs for you, okay? You would uh, say to, you know, to your computer, uh, uh, you know, is there a proof of, you know, the Riemann hypothesis, you know, of this number of symbols, okay? Uh, uh, you know, of, uh, um, you know, say a billion symbols or fewer, okay? And, uh, um, if P equals NP, what that means <coughs> is that any problem, you know, where your computer could recognize the solution in a reasonable amount of time, you know, polynomial amount of time, is also one where it could find the solution in polynomial amount of time. Okay, and, um, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, some people, you know, like to, like to quibble with this. They say, okay, what if you had an algorithm and it takes polynomial time, but the polynomial is n to the, t you know, to the 10,000th, right? And uh, as I look, you know, it's possible, you know, what if, what if the, uh, the aliens abducted John F. Kennedy to prevent him from discovering that algorithm, right? Also, I'm sorry. Uh, all sorts of things are, are, are logically possible, right? And, you know, and if they happen, then we'll sort of revise the question, okay? But uh, uh, so, uh, um, you know, in, in practice, uh, you know, when a problem is solvable in polynomial time, you know, you know very often it's uh, something like a, a linear or, or quadratic or something like that where, you know, we could really just practically program our computer, okay? And so, 
you know, what we would be talking about in some sense would be that uh, 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 mathematical creativity, you know, could be, could be automated, okay? And, you know, and not just mathematical creativity, but any kind of creativity, you know, for which uh, uh, once you've come up with uh, uh, the solution or whatever thing you're creating, you could program your computer to, uh, to check it for you, okay? So, so if you had a program to recognize great works of art, for example, right, then, you know, then you would also have a program program to create great works of art, okay? Not clear how you would write either program, but you know, but the second one kind of sounds harder than the first, doesn't it? So, uh, okay, but if, but if, P, equal, were P, if P were equal to NP, then, then it wouldn't be any harder. So that's, the, uh, that's really what we're talking about here. Okay, so uh, as many of you may know, the P versus NP question was first asked uh, in a now famous letter uh, in, uh, 19, from 1956, uh, which uh, Kurt Gödel uh, wrote to John von Neumann. And uh, von Neumann uh, at the time was dying of cancer in the hospital, and uh, Gödel wrote this uh, uh, letter saying, uh, my dear Mr. von Neumann, I hear that uh, you're now, uh, now recovering, which uh, he, uh, he wasn't, uh, but uh, you know, since you are, let me take the liberty of troubling you with a mathematical problem, okay? And uh, he then um, um, asked, uh, you know, can, can I just use this microphone instead? Yeah. All right. I'll maybe just try something. No. All right. Uh, this one, yeah. this, oh, okay. And um, he then asked uh, what uh, immediate uh, what um, what today uh, we would immediately recognize as the P versus NP question. Okay. Uh, uh, he says, you know, if there were, and he says, if there were a machine, uh, it's okay. No, thank you. Uh, for uh, solving, uh, you know, for finding a proof of, of length n with that had running time which was uh, linear in n, you know, or even quadratic in n, and we can sort of read between the lines and say he really meant polynomial in n, okay, uh, then, you know, this would have consequences of the greatest magnitude. He goes on to say, you know, it would mean that the mental effort of the mathematician could be completely replaced by machine, and then in a note, apart from the postulation of axioms. Okay, so um, you know, you, okay, you, you may ask, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, so so why haven't we solved this question yet? Well, you know, so so I actually get emails, you know, every other week claiming to have solved it. Uh, so uh, you know, in, in either direction. Uh, so, but uh, but our. Um, you know, it, 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 you know my, my feeling is that almost certainly P and NP are, are, are not equal. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm you know, my, I mean, the, the uh, you know, again, you know, it's, it's logically possible that they could be equal, you know, and it's logically possible that I'm not in Edinburgh right now, right? I mean, it's, uh, um, but, uh, um, uh, but, but um, you know, in order to prove that they're not equal, you know, seems to require sort of, you know, the creation of areas of mathematics that don't exist yet. So we're maybe, in, you know, in an analogous situation to people, you know, talking about uh, uh, Fermat's last theorem, you know, in the, in the uh, 17th century, right? We can state the problem, you know, we, we know what would count as an answer, you know, very reminiscent of the P versus NP question itself, in fact. Okay, and yet the fact that we, you know, we know how to recognize an answer doesn't mean that, you know, we 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 know how to find it. And um, so, um, um, okay, so so now, you know, you can um, continue, you know, studying P versus NP as a purely mathematical question. You know, I think it's, you know, as I said, you know, one of the great questions uh, of our time. And you know, and and it's, you know, it's not that we're, you know, sort of that we can say nothing at all, right? We can prove, you know, some things that are, you know, sort of pathetically weaker than. P not equal to NP, but that still, you know, have required decades of effort to be able to prove. You know, we also, we're very good at making excuses at this point. We can explain why the problem is so hard to solve, you know. Um, but, um, okay, but, but uh, you know, we can also sort of step back and say, and say was this really the right question to ask uh, in the first place? Uh, you know, and uh, a very important presupposition, you know, underlying P versus NP, you know, is that uh, this mathematical model of a polynomial time Turing machine, you know, really encompasses, you know, what, what we mean by uh, an efficient algorithm. Okay, and so the belief that it does that is often called the extended church Turing thesis. Okay, now the original church Turing thesis was the statement that the Turing machine sort of captures what is what we what we mean by computable. Okay, um, 
The extended church touring thesis would say that the polynomial time, you know, deterministic, well, or maybe probabilistic touring machine, you know, captures what we mean by efficiently computable. Okay, uh, and now it's, it, by the, I should say that it's not clear that, that um, you know, either of these theses are sort of actually what Church or Turing themselves believed. Okay, but you know, one, you know, this is a sad thing that, you know, after you pass away, you know, people can just impute to you whatever, whatever crazy thing they want. So, uh, um, so, you know, so I'm, I'm going to, you know, interpret the extended Church Turing thesis you know, in what I think is the most interesting way as sort of a falsifiable claim about the laws of physics. Okay, and, the, and so I'm going to interpret it as the statement that any physically realistic computing device can be simulated by a deterministic or, or maybe a randomized Turing machine with at most a polynomial overhead or, or increase in the time and memory that are needed. Okay, um, so... Uh, um, you know, so this is sort of the thesis that, that justifies us to sort of concentrate, you know, on this mathematical problem, right, of, you know, P versus NP, right? So, you know, it's worth spending some time to ask, well, you know, how sure are we of this thesis and have there been uh, any serious challenges to it? Okay, and that's, that's mostly what I want to talk about today. Uh, so let me, you know, so what do we mean by a challenge to the extended church touring thesis? Okay, well, we mean some proposal for, uh, you know, for how you could go, you know, beyond uh, um, the, the Turing machine model, you know, in order to do things sort of uh, uh, in a fundamentally more efficient way, sort of by taking advantage of the, you know, the other resources of nature, you know, besides just its, its uh, ability to, to support digital computation. Okay, so, so, so what, 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 what could such things be? Well, people have been kicking around such ideas, you know, since the, since the 1960s, uh, uh, you know, and, and so there, there's, you know, some old proposals that I really like. Uh, one of my favorites is uh, the soap bubble computer, okay, that, you know, this would, uh, the idea would be that a tub of soapy water would do what our fastest supercomputers cannot. Okay, so how would it work? Well, you would take two glass plates and you would put pegs between them uh, in a pattern, uh, you know, in whatever, whatever arrangement you wanted. And then you would dip the resulting uh, uh, configuration into a tub of soapy water. Okay, and sort of, you know, uh, uh, you know some soap bubbles will, will form, which connect the pegs together. Okay, and, you know, heuristically, you sort of expect soap films to want to relax into their lowest energy state. And you expect that lowest energy state to be one that would minimize sort of the total length of bubble connecting the pegs, where you know bubbles could you know maybe could meet at some intermediate points. Okay, and the interesting thing here is that finding this minimum length of line segments that uh, uh, connects you know a set of points in the Euclidean plane is a famous uh, NP-hard problem. Okay, it's called the, uh, the the minimum Steiner tree problem. Okay, and so, uh, um, so, you know, so if nature, you know, actually does this every time, you, you know, you dip something into, into soapy water, right, then, then you know, then, we, we, okay, we, we have our way to solve, you know, NP-complete problems, and we better revisit the extended church touring thesis. So, um, okay, so there was actually a discussion about this on the internet some years ago, and uh, 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 some people, um, you know, raised what I, you know, what I would think of as sort of the, you know, the obvious sort of objection or concern uh, with this proposal, uh, which is, uh, so, you know, you consider a fitness landscape, okay, this is uh, uh, the uh, 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 Hollywood Park, uh, and, uh, you, you know, now, now, you know, imagine that, that uh, you know, uh, you, you have some rock, which is, you know, over here, let's say, right? So it's, you know, it's at, it's at some crevice. Okay, now, you know, it has some gravitational potential energy. You know, if you think of it as trying to minimize its energy, well, in principle, it could do so by just sort of rolling up first and then rolling down the slope. Okay, but in practice, it's rarely observed to do that. So, uh, you know, so, so systems in nature, you know, they like to minimize their energy, but they can get trapped in, you know, in locally optimal configurations or metastable states, you know, call, you know, call them what you will. Okay, and so why shouldn't we expect that exactly the same will be true of this soap bubble computer? Okay, so, uh, 
you know, so this question came up, and, and uh, you know, and, and there were some people who said, well, you know, this is just an academic computer science party line. You know, you just repeat this. I bet none of you have done the actual experiment, and, you know, maybe it works. Anyway, so this is what led to the one foray of my life into experimental physics. So, uh, <laughs> so I went to the hardware store. The reason why I'm wearing these gloves is that I cut my hands on the glass. Uh, the people pointed out to me afterwards I should have used plexiglass, but see, this is why I'm a theorist. <laughs> so uh, what I found is that, you know, with, uh, you know, by the way, it's a great, you know, science fair project. You can try it at home. Uh, you know, with like three or four pegs, you know, indeed, you do generally find the minimum Steiner tree. Uh, and it's very cool to watch, to watch it settle into that. Okay, well, you know, when you start adding more pegs, like five or six, then what you find is, you know, sometimes, you know, you'll get a configuration which is not even a tree. Okay, so it has a cycle of, uh, you know, intermediate sort of bubbles. Okay, and there's a theorem that says that if you have cycles, then you can't be in an optimal configuration. Okay, so, so indeed it can get stuck in local minima. So, you know, we're not going to prove the Riemann hypothesis by this means. At, le at least I don't think, you know. I didn't try every variety of soap, every, you know, <laughs> and so forth. But, uh, um, you know, but, but uh, um, fine. Okay, so, uh, you know, now there are other approaches that people like to talk about that, uh, you know, involve some, you know, maybe a little bit similar in spirit. Okay, uh, one of them is, is protein folding, right? So, you know, uh, you know, every cell in your body, you know, contains, you know, all these proteins that, you know, in some sense are solving an extremely hard computational problem uh, by folding into their lowest energy configuration, okay? And, uh, you know, in fact, you know, it's so hard that, you know, our, uh, um, you know, people have had great success, you know, by sort of giving up on having computers fold these things and, you know, having humans, you know, working over the internet do it with this folded project. Okay, uh, and, you know, so, you know, under, under a certain way of formalizing, the protein folding problem, one can prove that it's NP-hard, you know, to find the lowest energy uh, folding pattern. Okay, and yet, you know, nature seems to, seems to do it effortlessly. Okay, so, so, so how could that be? Uh, well, so I think that the, um, you know, the best explanation in this case is that, uh, you know, actually, uh, uh, um, 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 proteins don't usually get stuck in local minima because if they did, then they would have been selected out by natural selection. Okay, proteins have evolved specifically, you know, in order to have sort of a wide basin, you know, leading to the global minimum, uh, you know, which, which they would tend to fold into. Now, even given that, proteins do occasionally misfold, you know, and this is what prions, you know, the agent of mad cow disease, uh, uh, appear to be. Okay, so, um, uh, so again, you know, well, you could create, in principle, you know, what the, the theory of NP-completeness says is that you could create a protein such that if you could fold it into its lowest energy configuration, then you would have proved the Riemann hypothesis. Okay, but, you know, probably if you just let this protein curl up, you know, you're not going to get the proof out, right? It's, uh, it's going to get into some, some local optimum. Okay, so, uh, uh, you know, then uh, uh, DNA computing is another idea that people talk about. You know, I mean, the, the big problem here is scalability, right? As the size of the problem that you're trying to solve increases, you need more and more DNA. You know, if you're trying to solve an NP-complete problem, you know, as people have done in various demonstrations, uh, the amount of DNA will actually increase exponentially with the, with the problem size, okay? And, you know, there's just you know, there's only so much DNA that, uh, you know, that, that, that we have. Okay, so, um, um, okay. Ah, but what about quantum computing? Well, given the title, you knew it was coming at some point. All right, well, this, you know, is extremely interesting, as, you know, I would say, you know, in, in some sense, sort of the first uh, serious challenge uh, that we've seen uh, to the extended church touring thesis. And in fact, you know, something that, uh, um, uh, you know, most of us conjecture actually does falsify the extended church touring thesis, or at least falsify it a little bit. Okay. Uh, so, all right, so first I have to tell you a little bit about what is quantum mechanics. Uh, well, here's the little bit. So, uh, no, so um, you know, I mean, I mean, physicists, you know, I think have... Uh, uh, you know, have fr have for, for 90 years, you know, if you'll let me editorialize, have sort of frightened the world, you know, into 
sort of uh, 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 thinking that quantum mechanics is hard. Uh, and uh, um, you know, and indeed it is hard if you want to know, you know, uh, uh, the, you know, understand the, the ground states of uh, you know of, 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 of atoms, and uh, you know, and, you know, in other in other words, uh, you know, if you actually want to do physics, okay. But but, <laughs> but 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 quantum mechanics is actually remarkably simple once you take the physics out of it. Okay? <laughs> so so that and and, and fortunately, you know that. The, you know, there's still enough left that we can actually see most of the conceptual things that you know that, that many people really want to know about. Okay, so uh, uh, so the way that I think of, about quantum mechanics is that uh, it's a certain you know very very interesting generalization of the laws of probability themselves. You know, which uh, which nature sort of unexpectedly forced on us. Okay, and. Um, Basically, it's sort of it's what you would inevitably get if you started with probability theory and then you said, I want something like probabilities, except I want them to also be negative numbers or even complex numbers. Okay. Um, um, yeah. So, so uh, nature nature seems to prefer things that way. Uh, so um, okay. So a bit more precisely, sort of the, the central sort of claim of quantum mechanics is that if you have an object, uh, any object, and if it can be in two uh, states you know, that can be distinguished perfectly by an observation, which we can label uh, 0 and 1, and you know, these asymmetrical brackets tend to drive the CS folks up a wall, but they're, you know, they're called the Dirac cat notation. You get used to them. Uh, uh, then, you know, then the object can also be in a, a, linear, a complex linear combination of the states called a superposition, okay, which we write alpha 0 plus beta 1, where alpha and beta are complex numbers called amplitudes satisfy the absolute value of alpha squared plus absolute value of beta squared equals 1. Okay, so if we were uh, restricted to real amplitudes only, then the possible states of a single quantum bit or, or qubit uh, uh, would just lie on a circle. Okay, so you can have like the zero state, which would be horizontal in this picture, the one state, which would be vertical, and you can have any sort of uh, uh, um, angle between those two. Like you could have uh, zero plus one over square root of two, which is that 45 degree angle. You could also have zero minus one over square root of two, which is something else. Um, Okay, now, question, you know, what happens if you look at the thing? Okay, well, uh, you know, you know it, it, it likes to sort of uh, be very indecisive when you're not looking, but, you know, when you, when you do look, then it has to make up its mind of what it wants to be. So uh, uh, if, you, if you ask the qubit, are you zero or one, well, then it's going to say it's zero with probability absolute value of alpha square, and it will say it's one with probability absolute value of beta squared. Okay, and also uh, the qubit will crucially will collapse to whatever uh, outcome you see. So uh, you know if you see the outcome one and you look, then you look a second time, nothing happen having happened in between, then you'll again see one. So uh, so so sort of the rest of the information disappears. Uh, okay, now to modify a state, you know, and a state could be uh, you know your linear combination of you know any number of these these possibilities. Say so n of them. Uh, what you get to do is sort of you know just the analog of a um, of, of a Markov uh, transition, but for uh, complex numbers. So you get to take this vector of amplitudes and you get to multiply it by any uh, n by n matrix that maps unit vectors to other unit vectors. Okay, so we call such a matrix a unitary matrix. Okay, so you know, as a simple example, uh, suppose we start in the state zero, and suppose we apply this operation here, okay, which is just a 45 degree counterclockwise rotation in the plane. Okay, well then, you know, if we apply it uh, once, then we're going to map zero to zero plus one over square root of two. Okay, now suppose, you know, we, we apply it a second time, then it's going to map that state to one. Okay, now what's strange about this? That, you know, this operation is acted as sort of a square root of not. Okay, that sort of it maps zero to a random combination of zero and one. It also maps one to a random combination of zero and one. And yet if you take zero and one together, then it maps that to definitely one. 
All right, so, 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 so what the hell is going on? Okay, well, uh, well, you know, one way to think about it, you know, of course, is just geometrically, but another way to think about it is that uh, when this uh, unitary is applied to this vector, well, there are two different ways that you could have gone back to the state zero, right? You could have, uh, like this or like this, right? Uh, you know, you, um, um, and, uh, um, and actually, um, uh, you know, you have to, in order to find the total amplitude, we're going back to the zero state, you have to add up the amplitudes from the different possible ways that you could have gotten there. Okay, and if one of those amplitudes is positive and the other one is negative, then the two amplitudes can cancel each other out, or as we say, interfere destructively. Okay, and then the result will be that the zero state will never be observed at all. Okay, and any time you hear anything about the weirdness of quantum mechanics, you know, wave particle duality, uh, you know, uh, uh, spooky action at a distance, you know, insert your favorite phrase, right? At the end of the day, it ultimately boils down to these positive and, and negative numbers canceling each other out. Okay, don't tell you know, uh, physicists, I, I let you in on the secret, or, you know, if, if you are a physicist, you know, please, I, I repent, okay? So, <laughs> all right. So, now, what is the idea of, of quantum computing? Uh, well, you know, you think about a quantum state of n qubits, you know, then, you know, to describe its state, you actually need to give an amplitude for every possible uh, configuration of all uh, n of, of the qubits. Okay, so that's two to the n amplitudes. Okay, uh, so what is that saying? It's saying that just to describe the, you know, a general configuration of, let's say, a thousand particles, you know, each of which could be like in two different spin states, saying that nature, off to the side somewhere, has to keep, you know, on scratch paper, you know, some sort of list of two to the thousand complex numbers. Okay, and it's got to keep updating that list over and over and over as the, you know, as, as the thing evolves, right? That's a lot of work for nature to be going through. Okay, and, uh, you know, to, uh, you know the, 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 this fact sort of wasn't emphasized until relatively recently, okay? But, you know, from a computer science point of view, this is, you know, arguably the most striking thing about quantum mechanics, okay? Just, you know, that it, it says that sort of uh, the state space of nature is just so much more enormous than what we directly observe. Okay, but then, you know, this also leads, um, okay, so, so look, so, so chemists and physicists, you know, actually did know about this for many decades. They knew about it as a practical problem, okay? Something that made quantum systems hard to simulate on our, our current computers. Uh, and, you know, actually Nobel Prizes in physics and chemistry have been awarded for, you know, coming up with somewhat better ways to just to, to uh, uh, simulate quantum mechanics faster on, uh, on our computers, such as the density functional theory. Okay, but now um, in, in the uh, 1980s, uh, a few physicists like uh, uh, Richard Feynman and David Deutsch, you know, had the amazing idea that you could sort of uh, turn, turn that lemon into lemonade, okay? That uh, you could sort of turn that, that difficulty on its head if, you know, if quantum mechanics is, is so hard to simulate on our existing computers, then why don't we build computers that themselves would take advantage of quantum mechanical principles, okay, of, uh, of uh, superposition and, and interference, and uh, that would therefore th themselves exploit the exponentiality which seems to be inherent in quantum mechanics. All right, well, as many of you may know, you know, the, well, this is a striking idea. Actually building a scalable quantum computer uh, seems to be a damn hard problem. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the record so far is that uh, uh, 15 has been factored by a quantum computer into 3 times 5 uh, with high probability. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, after some, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, maybe a billion dollars of, of effort, you know, into this field. So, uh, uh, you know, we think that, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, it's easy to laugh about it, but then again, you know, people also laughed at Charles Babbage in the 1830s, right? So, uh, you know, and in that case, it took, you know, it took more than a century, really, for the, for, the trans for the vacuum tube and then transistor to be invented and for the technology to catch up with the theory. Okay, in the case of quantum computing, we don't know how long it's going to take. Uh, the central difficulty is uh, what's called decoherence. You know, in other words, you know, quantum states are extremely fragile, okay? Uh, you know, if any sort of stray particle 
passes through you know, the computer and uh, sort of carries away some information about it, then uh, it is as if uh, that particle has measured the quantum computer state. OK, and you remember what I said about measurement in quantum mechanics being a destructive process. OK, and so, uh, what, you know, so what you have to do uh, to, is keep a, a quantum computer extremely well isolated from its external environment, and yet somehow at the same time go in you know, and, and do the operations you know, and drive the computation forward. OK, and those twin requirements seem you know, incredibly hard to satisfy. You know, some people even think that it will be impossible. Okay, but you know, my my own view is that if it's impossible, that's actually much more exciting than if it's possible, because this would mean that you know we you know either quantum mechanics is wrong or we we really just don't understand it. So uh, you know that would be you know uh, uh, you know an, 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 you know an un unbelievable opportunity to learn something. The more the more boring possibility is that indeed quantum computers are possible. You know, but they'll just be really 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 hard to build. Okay, so. Um, OK, but now you know, I want to think about what could a quantum computer actually do if, if we eventually had one. OK, and pretty much every popular article which has ever been written about the subject you know, has gotten it wrong. OK, so, uh, um, you know, so what, what they normally say is that, well, unlike a classical computer, which could try the possible solutions one by one, a quantum computer would try all of them in parallel. And this would let it you know, be exponentially faster. OK, uh, you know, it would, it would, it would be great if it, if it worked that way. You know, we really wouldn't have to think so hard at all, right? Uh, but, um, you know, unfortunately, that's not how it works. OK, and here's the problem. Uh, you know, yes, you can put a quantum computer into the superposition over all of the exponentially many uh, possible solutions to a computational problem. However, you know, at some point, you've got to measure the thing in order to get an answer out. Okay? And as I said, when you make a measurement, you only get one result. Okay? And furthermore, you don't get to choose which one. You don't get to dictate that it be the correct one. Okay? You're just going to get a random one with probability given by the squared amplitude. Okay, and of course, if you just wanted a random answer, well, you could have forgotten about the quantum computer and just picked one yourself, with, you know, by you know, rolling some dice. Rolling some dice. Okay, so, um, okay, so what this means is that any hope of solving problems faster by a quantum computation has to rest on the magic of minus signs. Okay, it has to rest on you know, choreographing a pattern of interference between positive and negative amplitudes. So what you have to do is set things up so that the, all the paths leading to a given a wrong answer would interfere destructively. Some of them having positive amplitude, others having negative amplitude, so that they cancel each other out. Whereas all the amplitudes leading to a given right answer should all have amplitude, you know, or all or most of them should have amplitudes of the same sign, so that they would interfere constructively. You know, in that case, when you measured the thing, then a right answer would be observed with high probability. Okay, now that's a very delicate requirement. It was far from obvious to people whether that was going to be possible at all for any interesting problem. Okay, in fact, you know, for more than a decade, you know, the only application that we knew for a quantum computer was to simulate quantum mechanics. Okay, well, yes, that is very useful, and you know, and that it can do. Okay, but can it do anything else? So, okay, uh, well, so okay, like anything else, uh, um, um, you know, com uh, like any other great question about the nature of the world, uh, uh, computer scientists can associate to it an inscrutable sequence of capital letters. So, so that's what was done in this case uh, by you know my advisor of uh, Azarani and, uh, and Ethan Bernstein in 1993. So they defined a complexity class, which was the quantum version of P polynomial times. So this is the class BQP. Bounded error quantum polynomial time. This is the, the you know the class of problems solvable efficiently by a quantum computer. Okay, and the, the bounded error is because we're not going to insist that it get the right answer 100 percent of the time. Right? If it only got the right answer 90 percent of the time, that would be fine because we could just rerun the computer you know a bunch of times and take the majority vote. Okay, and indeed you know this is how uh, um, almost all quantum algorithms actually work. Okay, so uh, you know, as many of you you know may have heard, the sort of uh, 
bombshell discovery, you know, uh, uh, in this field came, you know, about a year later when uh, Peter Shor, uh, who was then at, at uh, Bell Labs, uh, showed that uh, the problem of factoring integers uh, is in BQP. Okay, and uh, this made many people interested in quantum computing, uh, you know, including, uh, I guess, you know, the NSA, the GCHQ, uh, you know, and so forth, because, uh, you know, of course, uh, if you can factor integers, you know, that's interesting, you know, well, firstly, you know, for, to, to some number theorists, and secondly, to anyone who wants to read anyone else's email. <laughs> uh, so, or, you know, or, or, or swipe their credit card number. Okay, uh, so just to give you, you know, a little sort of map of, of, of uh, you know, a revised world map. So, you know, we have P, the, you know, so pro efficient, uh, we solvable problems for a classical computer. Above it is NP, you know, at the top of NP are these NP complete problems. Okay, you now, you know, the, the most interesting problems for, from a quantum computing standpoint are the ones in this intermediate region that are in NP, but that don't seem to be either in P or NP complete. We only have sort of relatively few examples of such problems, but, you know, they, 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 these are the problems that tend to arise in cryptography. Okay, and, you know, one of the most famous is factoring. Okay, and so BQP, you know, well, it certainly contains P. Um, and, uh, you know, and it also uh, contains factoring, okay? Uh, on the other hand, um, as you can see from this picture, well, we neither, you know, uh, 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 know nor believe that, you know, that BQP contains all of NP, okay? And that's, that's something I'm going to come to, the reasons for that, okay? That would, you know, that would really be amazing if quantum computers could solve NP-complete problems in polynomial time, okay? And now, certainly, we can't prove that they can't. Right, why not? Well, we can't even prove that classical computers can't solve them. <laughs> That's the P versus NP question. Okay, so for sure we can't prove that BQP doesn't contain NP. Okay, but, you know, uh, but, but we certainly don't know that it does. It seems to just, you know, sort of uh, 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 cut across in this sort of uh, strange way, you know, and incidentally, we also don't know whether BQP is contained in NP, right? Maybe it sort of protrudes outward like this. Okay, so yeah, so factoring, you know, okay, I just, I just said all this. Uh, all right, so, 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 so why don't we believe that BQP contains all of NP? Right, well, you know, you know, you could say, you know, for more or less the same reasons why we believe that P doesn't equal NP. That, you know, first of all, people have tried to found, find an algorithm, you know, and, and they failed. And second of all, if there were such an algorithm, it would change the world, and, you know, and we don't believe in miracles. Okay, so, uh, okay, now we can say a little bit more than that, you know, but uh, there's an important theorem uh, due to Bennett, Bernstein, Broussard, and Vazirani uh, uh, from the 90s that says that sort of, in some sense, quantum magic will not be enough to solve NP-complete problems in polynomial time. Okay, and so more precisely, what they showed is that if you take an NP-complete problem and you throw away its structure, and you just imagine it as sort of an abstract landscape of two to the n possible solutions, where all you know how to do you know, for each solution is just you know, ask, is it correct or is it not correct? Right? You don't know anything more than that. You're just sort of stabbing in the dark. Well, then you know, a quantum computer can, you know, even, even you know, when you've tied its hands behind its back you know, like this, it can still do somewhat better than a classical one. Okay? It can solve the problem in, two, in only two to the n over two steps, as opposed to the two to the n that would be needed classically. Okay, so it can uh, find the, the solution in the square root of the number of steps that would be needed classically. Okay, and this is, um, uh, this is, uh, you know, the second most famous algorithm called a uh, quantum algorithm called Grover's algorithm. Okay, on the other hand, um, you know, even before Grover's algorithm was discovered to exist, it was already proved to be optimal. Okay, that's what uh, that's what Bennett et al. did. Okay, they showed that uh, that actually any quantum algorithm, you know, in, in this setting, has to make at least two to the n over two queries. Okay, so you're not going to just sort of blindly like, ignoring the structure, you know, uh, get a, uh, uh, and just doing like what the popular articles say, right? Get a quantum algorithm that solves NP-complete problems in polynomial time. 
Okay. So, so if you want such an algorithm, then just like a classical algorithm, you're going to have to exploit the structure of the problems in some interesting way. So this raises the question, is there any quantum algorithm for these problems that would exploit their structure? Okay, so we basically have one example of uh, the, the quantum adiabatic algorithm, which is an amazing algorithm uh, proposed by uh, Ed Farney and um, some uh, colleagues in the uh, physics department at MIT in uh, 2000, and they spent the last 12 years basically trying to understand what this algorithm does. Okay, so, uh, but, you know, but the idea is that, you know, you, that you sort of uh, apply intuition from uh, condensed matter physics. So uh, you start out, so it's basically this algorithm, if you know about classical local search algorithms, like simulated annealing, um, things of that kind, uh, this is basically a quantum version of uh, simulated annealing. Okay, so uh, what you do is you start out applying this Hamiltonian, which is like the instantaneous time version of a unitary transformation. Okay, and uh, you know, when you do this, the system has some lowest energy state that it likes to reside in, okay, and you know, so you just leave it in that state. Okay, but then you slowly vary the Hamiltonian to some final one called H sub F, um, whose lowest energy state uh, actually encodes the solution to an NP-complete problem of interest to you. Okay, and that can certainly be done. Okay, but now there's uh, an important result called the adiabatic theorem, which says that as long as you vary the Hamiltonian slowly enough, the, the ground state, you know, the, the state of your system will just, will just track the ground state. It'll be just dragged along. Okay, so what this means is that as long as you change slowly enough, then you are going to end in the ground state of HF, and you'll get the solution to your NP-complete problem. Okay, so everything boils down to the question, just how slowly is slowly enough? Okay, well, the speed at which you have to vary the Hamiltonian depends on what's called the spectral gap. Okay, so it's the gap between the smallest and the second smallest eigenvalues of the, uh, the instantaneous Hamiltonian. Um, and uh, here's what you see, here's what you typically see when you plot this get that gap for some, you know, NP complete problem such as 3 set, okay? You know, the adiabatic algorithm is trying to solve it, right? It does fine here, fine here, fine here. And then there's this one point where these, you know, smallest and second smallest eigenvalues, you know, look, they look almost like they're crossing each other, okay? They're not quite crossing, but, you know, they come really, really close to each other, you know, in fact, exponentially close to each other. And, uh, you know, the, the running time was determined by the inverse of that gap, uh, you know, and, uh, and it's because of that one sort of crossing place that you've got to run the algorithm for exponential time. Okay, so, uh, uh, you know, now Farhi uh, has uh, told me that uh, he once, you know, went to an expert in condensed matter physics and described the adiabatic algorithm. Is it based on your intuition about physical systems? You know, do you think that the, uh, the, the eigenvalue gap in the system should decrease polynomially or exponentially as the number of particles grows to infinity? And the expert thought about this and said, I think exponentially. And uh, he said, well, well, why? You know, what, what, what leads you to say that? And he says, well, because otherwise your algorithm would work. <laughs> <laughs> so that actually, you know, I, you know I, think it, I think it actually raises a very deep point that I want to come back to, right? Which is that, uh, you know, if, um, you know, we can, we can sort of, you know, study the laws of physics and see what they say about the hardness of NP-complete problems, right? But at some point, you know, it may become something like uh, the impossibility of, faster than light communication or, you know, the, the um, uh, impossibility of perpetual motion machines where, you know, if, like if someone claims that, uh, uh, um, you know, that, 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 that they've, you know, detected uh, neutrinos that are going faster than light or something, right, you know, probably it's just a wiring problem, right? Uh, so, um, uh, so uh, you know, we so like we can we can take you know sort of uh, uh, you know we can we can go backwards. We can say supposing we believe that you know these sort of impossibility principles are a basic part of nature. Then what are their implications for other parts of physics? Okay, we can say you know why is this gap exponentially small? Well, it's exponentially small because otherwise NP would be contained in BQP. <laughs> Okay, so, you know, so what could we do if we really, really want to solve NP-complete problems? Well, you know, there, now we enter sort of a hypothetical realm 
where you know we discussed how would we have to vary the laws of physics, you know, <laughs> which you know, which would be great. Okay, you know, in order that n be complete problems would become easy to solve. All right, and there's you know some some great uh, uh, you know ideas along these lines. So uh, there was a proposal by Abrams and Lloyd. Uh, and, and they pointed out that the Schrodinger equation, which is sort of the defining equation of, of you know, quantum mechanics that controls the unitary uh, uh, evolution, is a precisely linear differential equation. Okay, but they, they noticed that if you added even the tiniest nonlinear term uh, to that equation, then actually um, the Bennett et al. Uh, uh, limitation would no longer hold. And in fact, NP complete problems would become solvable in polynomial time. Okay, and the basic reason for that is that a nonlinear evolution would no longer need to preserve the angle between vectors. Okay, so you know it's not hard to create one qubit, which is in the state zero, if there are no solutions to some NP complete problem, and which is in a state which is just exponentially close to zero if there's one solution. Now, in ordinary quantum mechanics, these states, you know, cannot can, 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 can hardly at all be distinguished by a measurement. Okay, you would have to repeat the experiment exponentially many times before you saw any difference between these two states. Okay, but in nonlinear quantum mechanics, you can apply some transformation that just sort of pushes these two states apart until they're nearly orthogonal, and then you can distinguish them. Okay, now, it turns out that if the Schrodinger equation were nonlinear, then you could also send signals faster than light, you could violate the uncertainty principle, yeah, you could do a lot of fun stuff. <laughs> okay, so probably you know, the fact that you could solve NP-complete problems this way is sort of giving us one more indication maybe of why the Schrodinger equation actually is linear. Right. Okay, now another of my favorites, you know, if the quantum computer is not going to do it, well then how about the relativity computer? Okay, and the idea here is an extremely simple one. Thinks that you would start your computer working on some extremely hard computational problem. Okay, then you would leave your computer on Earth. Then you would board a spaceship and you would accelerate to very, very close to the speed of light. Okay, you would fly around and decelerate, come back to Earth. Now, in Earth time, uh, billions of years would have passed. All of your friends would be long dead. Civilization would probably have collapsed. Okay, but if you know your computer is somehow still there running, then you know you'll find a solution to your hard problem. Okay, so you know what's wrong with this proposal, right? Why don't we try it, right? So you know, okay, so, you know, there's a matter of your friends being dead. Or fine, so just bring them along in the spaceship, right? But um, okay, I think it's you know it's an interesting question to ask, you know, what. What in the laws of physics actually prevents this from, 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 from working? I mean, uh, so, uh, uh, so, you know, I, I think that sort of probably the best answer, you know, focuses on how much energy would you need in order to accelerate to sufficiently close to relativistic speed. Okay, you can show that in order to get an exponential speed up by this sort of approach, you would have to go uh, exponentially close to the speed of light, which then means that, you know, you would need a... Uh, 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 an exponential amount of energy, which means that your fuel tank or whatever was powering your spaceship would have to be exponentially large, and so just building, you know, the, the fuel tank would take exponential time, right? Or, you know, for the fuel from the far part of the tank to affect you would, uh, uh, you know, and so, so it's a very interesting trade-off, right? And this is sort of a general uh, phenomenon that when you ignore some of what we know about the laws of physics, you can often make it look like we have computational superpowers, okay? But then taking everything into account, you know, it, uh, you know, usually, you know, it goes away. Okay, so I'll just you know mention one other thing, which is the uh, the Zeno's computer, which is uh, my other favorite. Okay, and the idea here is that you would run the first step of your computation in one second. You'd run the second step in half a second, the third in a quarter second, the fourth in an eighth second, and so forth. So that after two seconds, you would have done infinitely many steps. Okay, well that sounds really great, right? Why don't we try it? Well, in fact, people do try it, okay? Something like they try to overclock their microprocessor, okay? You know, run it faster than you're supposed to. Okay, now, the danger, as many of you may, may know, when you do that, is that your microprocessor may melt, okay, if you run it too fast. Okay, so then what you have to do is you have to cool it. Okay, and in fact, what supercomputers are today often is that they're just a cluster of off-the-shelf Intel chips or whatever, which are cooled, you know, to close to absolute zero so that they can be safely run a lot faster. 
Okay, so, um, but now um, cooling takes energy, right? And now, you know, the faster you want to run your computer, right, the more you need to cool it, the more energy that takes. Okay, you know, does this, re you know, when or where does this reach a limit? Okay, well, we, you know, we don't know exactly. Okay, but, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know in, in current physics, it looks like you would reach a limit when you, if you tried to run your computer at more than one, uh, clock cycle per 10 to the minus 43 seconds. One clock cycle per Planck time, okay? If you did this, then actually you, would, you can calculate that you would need so much energy that uh, your cooling system would exceed what's called the Schwarzschild uh, bound. That would actually cause your computer to collapse to a black hole. <laughs> Which I like, the sort of nature's way of telling you that you can't do something. Okay. All right, so I, I also had something about time travel computers, but I think I would need time travel to talk about it because I'm out of time. I can say something if, if so, you know, someone wants to ask me later. Uh, so all right, so you know, these sort of things lead to what you might call the no supersearch postulate, which would say that there is no physical means to solve NP-complete problems in polynomial time. Now this you know, conjecture would include P not equal to P not equal to NP is a special case, but is actually stronger because this is also a statement about the laws of physics. Okay, and if it's true, then it would explain, quote unquote, you know, why these adiabatic systems have small spectral gaps, why the Schrodinger equation is linear, you know, why time travel isn't possible, you know, in, into the past anyway, you know, time travel into the future is possible. Um, so, uh, um, Okay, so you know, you do have to worry about things like what exactly does it mean to solve an NP-complete problem? You know, I think that the answer is, you know, you, you know, you can often have things that look like they're, in some implicit sense, they're getting the answer, but then when you make a measurement, then you don't actually get it, okay? And so I think, you know, you've gotta be very, very careful to define things in a way that, you know, that, that solving a problem means that you actually get to measure the answer and get it out at the end. And I had a whole example to illustrate that, but I'm gonna skip it. All right, so in conclusion, you know, one could imagine worse research agendas than, you know, proving P not equal to NP, proving that not even quantum computers can solve NP-complete problems, you know, building a scalable quantum computer, or even more interesting, sort of showing that it's impossible. Um, clarifying, you know, can at least all of known physics be uh, simulated efficiently by a quantum computer? Okay, what about quantum field theory? What about, you know, the standard model? Right, do we need, you know, a new Higgs boson complexity class, right, and so forth. So, you know, there was a recent breakthrough about simulating some quantum field theories using a standard quantum computer. You know, this was already very non-trivial. It looks like probably, you know, the standard model and all of, you know, ordinary quantum field theory should be simulable on a quantum computer. But, you know, even this has not been rigorously shown yet. Okay, and then that would still leave the question of what about quantum gravity, right? Where, you know, well, we don't yet have a theory of quantum gravity, so it's a bit, you know, premature to be defining complexity classes, right? Uh, so, okay, uh, you know, and then, but then one can also say, you know, how much of physics can one derive from starting from this no super search or from other uh, proposed impossibility principles uh, about computation? Okay, so I'll stop there, so thanks. This production is copyright, the University of Edinburgh.